It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile app. Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Today, we're joined by someone that spent 25 years in the NFL in various personnel roles in the front office. Uh, he was a director of college scouting recently. He was a vice president of personnel with the Philadelphia Eagles. So he, he obviously knows he knows how to build a team based on how the Eagles have played these last couple of years. He is TJ McGrate, who is now the director of of scouting over at the 3013. Go check it out at the 3013.com. TJ, John Schmelk here uh, in the Giants facility in East Rutherford. I think our fans will forgive you for your Eagles affiliation, given the great information you're going to bring them today. How you doing, man? Good, John. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Nah, no problem. Absolutely. It's uh, good to have you on the program. So let's start here. Um, right now, teams are kind of in their draft meetings right now, talking to their coaches, their scouts, everybody in their front office about putting together their draft board. What was this process like for you, especially with Philadelphia the last few years trying to get everything done? Well, I would say at this point of where we are in the process, now you're really getting the coaches involved. You give the coaches players to do, and you kind of compare that to what the scouts did. And then you also have the pro days that, that have been going on. You have the combine. So now you're getting all that extra information and you're putting your board together from one to usually 125, 150. And basically now you're, you're trying to get through clumps of players and organize them and figure those clumps of players out. Yeah, absolutely. And to explain it for fans, boards are stacked horizontally and vertically, right? So you have them ranked one through whatever, 250, however many guys are on your board, 150, 200. And then you have them stacked horizontally where you can see them ranked by position, correct? So you're kind of yes. working them both at the same time. I guess we'll start here. Traditionally, TJ, how many people did you guys have on your board when all was said and done at the end of this draft process? There was usually about 145 or 150 players that we felt could be on our team, draftable players that we would pick that we would want on the Eagles or whichever team I was at. Now, I figured fans would be like, wait, wait a second. There's seven rounds. There's, you know, 230, 40 picks with, you know, with, with the comp picks. When you get to the end of the draft, did you always have guys left on your board or did you sometimes get wiped out given the length of the draft and the numbers of people on your board? I would say we've always had players that we would pick. We would never be completely wiped out, but it oftentimes the board kind of gets picked off just like you have it. So you're not wiped out, but you feel like you get a, you did a good job because that's the way the draft went. If the board, that's the way the, the, the board just kind of got peeled off. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess let me ask you this way then too. What gets you down to 150? Is it just based on thresholds you guys have at certain positions where guys just don't fit your program and your scheme on either side? What is the biggest driving factor from getting that board down to so few players when so many are draft eligible? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the player, the person. You're eliminating a lot of players just based off they're not a good fit for your team. You know, just like any business, John, it, you don't want to work with jerks. You don't want to be around people that, you know, aren't a fit in what you're trying to accomplish. So a lot of players are eliminated off that right there. And then you, you also, we all always pick the best player. We always pick the best player, but there is an aspect of need in that. You know, if, if, if we have, if we're strong at a certain position, we're certainly not going to, you know, take that player just, just because he's good, but we have a player that's almost as good at a different position. We would take that player. No, that makes total sense. All right. Now let me ask you, how do you, put position value TJ into your draft process when you grade the guys do you just grade them based on how good they are and then when you stack them you might stack them with position value in mind how do you put that into your process where it's reflected in your board and your grades and how you stack them on draft day well when you grade the player in the fall you're grading on what kind of player he is related to the scheme you run 
And as the process goes, you talk through it more in depth to see if he would be a fit for you. Now, all the teams I've always bid on, John, they were best player available. We would pick the best player. But there's a little caveat to that. And what I what I would say would be if if you have your players ranked like A, B, C, D, E, and F, just like you would in school, you would take you would take a B minus over a B plus based on need, but you would never take a B plus over an A minus based on need. In other words, you wouldn't leave a certain standard, but within a, a, a grade, you would go based on need and pick that player. If that yeah, makes it's sense. almost you have guys in tiers, right? Where you yes. have like six or seven guys in a tier. And you'll say, all right, well, we have a, a guard with this in a tier with a corner or you know, offensive tackle. Then based on either need or how you value the positions, that's how you're going to delineate those virtual quote unquote ties on your grading board. Exactly right. Yep. That makes sense. Because I think people look at the way the Eagles are drafted and the way Howie Roseman has operated, which, by the way, has been very well given the roster he's put together. And they kind of sit there and they're like, well, Howie, you know, he only wants to draft offensive linemen and defensive linemen, and that's who he targets in the draft. But as someone that's been in that room and seen the process, these are the best graded players on the board. There's nobody that you're passing on in a in a significantly higher tier at a different spot to, to focus on the fronts on both sides of the ball. Absolutely not. They're not going to pass on a great player. They're going to they're going to take the best player available. No, I look, I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. I think we're seeing with the draft this year, and I think it's been a, a, a bit of a trend, TJ. Players are shrinking, right? I mean, they're just not as big anymore, especially on the perimeter and a wide receiver. And I, I think you're a really interesting person to talk to here because the Eagles are, are a team that two years ago in a trade that really made Giant fans angry, to be quite honest with you, he traded up to grab Devonta Smith, right? And he was, you know, he he didn't really weigh in the process. He, he was around 170, 165. I don't know whatever number you guys had on him. But you decided that, look, even though he's an outlier in terms of weight, he's worth picking. So I guess my question for you is when you guys looked at Devonta Smith, what made you say, all right, even though not many guys at this size has necessarily had that lot of success in the league, this is a guy that we're not only willing to pick, but willing to pick in the top 12. I think the game has changed. The game is such a spread out game now. You don't need that girth at that position as much as you as you used to. It's all about speed, spacing, timing, quickness. And like with a player like that, he understood what when I watched him, he understands how to take a hit. Now, I'm not saying he's not a tough guy, but he understands how to protect himself and how to take a hit. And that it comes from an instinct that the kid has and outstanding body control. So when I remember when I graded him and evaluated him, that really stuck out to me. The kid understood how to take a hit. Yeah. And I thought the other thing, TJ, when I watched him that year, you know, you worry about the smaller guys getting off press outside. No one could press him. I, it, he was just so good at the line of scrimmage that that also really wasn't a worry, at least when I watched him. He, he has an incredible knack for that to go along with the quickness to avoid people. And that's I bring back to the instinctive part of the game. Very instinctive kid. He understands. Some of these players, and they've been doing seven-on-seven seven camps since they were eight, nine, ten years old. They do this a lot. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, these they were playing in the backyard and just playing for their high school team. These kids are, are so skilled now in regards to route running, catching the ball, throwing the ball, under, understanding how to run a route, weave and stem. They're just they're so good at it because they do it so much now. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. So. You look at it, this draft class now, you got, I'll just throw a few names out there. You know, you got Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, Josh Downs, uh, just guys that are not very big. And, and TJ, I think the Giants right now have a plethora of guys in, in their building that are considered probably by most as being slot guys. Wando Robinson was drafted last year. Paris Campbell has played the slot. Throw Sterling Shepard into the mix. They signed Jamison Crowder this offseason, right? Guys that primarily have operated in the slot. So when you're looking at, at these smaller wide receivers, what are the traits that you keep an eye on that make you think they can succeed outside and not just be slot only players? Well, I want to see them do it in college. I want to see them play on the outside, be able to stretch the field, 
be able to run the different route concepts an outside player would run. But to me, a receiving core should be like a basketball team. You need a little quick guy. You need a big power forward. You need a center. You have to have a, a variety of different players. And I mean, the Giants are at 25 in this draft. There will be a receiver there that can play on the outside. There's going to be someone there. Um, I understand that they would probably want to get bigger, though, that you'd want a guy with some size that can go on the outside and stretch the field. What's the advantage, TJ, in building a basketball team like that? Because you're right. Look, you stand A.J. Brown next to Devonta Smith. They're literally 50 pounds apart, yet they play the same position. And it's crazy to think that, but they do. So what's the advantage? You talk about the types of routes you want on the run, the type of way you want to use them. Can you just kind of get a little bit more in depth in, in how having a basketball team helps your offense operate in that way? Well, I think it's all about helping the quarterback and what makes the quarterback feel secure. And you may have an inside slot player who's not as big, but he has incredible quickness and route awareness where he can find that little dead area, get open, and the quarterback can throw the ball. Or you may have a guy on the outside who has incredible size and length and ball skills, and that gives the quarterback another security blanket where I know, hey, on this route with this player size I can just kind of throw the ball up and he can go up and get it so I think the it's all about protecting the quarterback making him feel secure and there's just different skill sets for those different routes for different places that they're aligned on the field that's how I basically would say it no look, I think that makes total sense and when you look at this wide receiver class we could dig into it a little bit more now and you can check out uh, the big board at the 33rdteam.com. And I love this board because it's a little bit different than what we see from other people. But, you know, you and other people that worked in the league have put it together, which I think will give fans the idea of how different some of these boards can can be around the league sometimes. And, you know, you have Addison as your wide receiver two, you know, 173. Jalen Hyatt is your wide receiver three, 176. Uh, you have Josh Downs as your wide receiver five, 171. Zay Flowers as your wide receiver six, 182. And shockingly, he did not weigh in at his pro day. I wonder why. Uh, he's <laughs> probably in the 170s as well. So when you look at those four guys, TJ, separate them for me a little bit. How are they different? And based on what the Giants have on their roster, which guy do you think would be a really good fit for what the Giants do? Well, I, I like bits and pieces of, of each one of them. What stood out with Addison to me is how crafty and instinctive he is as a route runner. Very, very polished. Looks like he's been doing it his whole life. I like him a lot. Now, he may not be the most explosive player, but uh, he's going to be a really good pro. He's going to be a really good pro. Hyatt has the outstanding explosiveness. If I'm a defensive coordinator, he scares the heck out of me because he's so explosive. Um, Downs, I would say, is similar. He doesn't have that size, but he is fast. Maybe not the explosiveness as Hyatt as far as play speed, but he can really roll. And then you have another small guy with flowers. And, you know, these small guys got to be fast. But if I'm the Giants, I think I'm looking more with players with size. Uh, John, a player that could maybe sneak into the first round and maybe in that ballpark, for the Giants is Jonathan Mingo from Ole Miss. Now, he's a big, fast, strong, tough guy with crazy outstanding ball skills. He's a guy to keep an eye on. And, you know, Quentin Johnston is our number one receiver. He may not go number one. You know, we don't make our base our, base our big board on where they're going to go, but right. how they're going to be NFL players and how they're going to produce. There's an outside chance he could be there. Yeah, and Quentin Johnson, TJ, is interesting to me because he he's almost like a weird profile where he's a, a he's tall, but he's not great on contested catches. But he's he's skinny, but he's great after the catch, and he doesn't run a you know a, a really wide route tree. So how do you kind of parse all those differences in his in his games? I have trouble finding you know guys similar to him at his size with his skills that are currently in the league. But at the same time, you do based on his traits see how high that ceiling could get. Yeah, I I thought that he flashed some really good things with the ball in the air down the field. I think he's going to be a better pro. Very similar to Dawson Knox from the same school. Remember, he was a tight end. He's now with the Bills, yeah. who didn't really have a productive college career at Ole Miss, but he gets to the NFL and he's a better pro. I think this kid could be a better pro than he was in college, and uh, he's very interesting. I'm sorry, I was talking about Mingo. 
But with Quentin Johnston, I saw flashes of things that were really good with him down the field. And like you mentioned, the run after the catch was outstanding. And then you mentioned you want to see the guys do it, right? So I want to ask you about Jackson Smith and Jigba. Now, I don't think he's going to be there when the Giants pick at 25, but he's a guy we really didn't see play outside much at Ohio State. But he has the the size to do it, six foot one ninety six. He's certainly a great route runner. His his three cone and his you know lateral quickness drills were, were phenomenal. Really good route runner. So when you see a guy like that that hasn't done it, is that someone that you're more comfortable projecting outside just based on his traits and and what he's done on the field? I feel like Jackson is more of an inside slot, okay. crafty receiver. Um, the 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 problem I have with Jackson is his speed. I uh, I know he ran he ran fairly well at his pro day, but the play speed on the field is very concerning. But he's still going to be a solid player because he can do everything else so well. But the speed is a big concern. But I think he's a slot inside player. Yeah, and I got to imagine when you talk about finding guys that are going to play outside, being able to stack these guys and get behind them and challenge deep has to be a big part of that, right? You want someone outside that that can challenge vertically, right? Yes, because if you have if, if you don't have any speed on the outside, it allows the defenses to do a lot of things that will hurt you. You have to threaten them with that outside explosiveness. Now I'm hundred percent with you. You mentioned Mingo as a guy that gets slid into the first round. There seems to be a little group here, and in the way I put my groupings together in tiers, I kind of have the same thing where you mentioned Mingo, but you also have Cedric Tillman. You have Rashi Rice, you have Keishon Butte, you have A.T. Perry, you know, this kind of group that's in a cluster of bigger wide receivers that can play outside that are probably, you know, late second round, mid second round pick type of area. Is that group, if one of those guys is available, good value for the Giants in round two, if they don't go, if they don't go for a wide receiver with the 25th overall pick? Yep. So if you're going to take one of those guys in round two, you're going to get a, a, a player with outstanding size. You may not get quite the explosiveness that you'll get in the first round. Yeah. That's what you, you know, you're going to get in round two, but those guys you mentioned like AT Perry, AT Perry has a rare trait with his size. And when you watch the film, he can do some outstanding things. He's hard to cover just because he's so big, but yeah, all those guys you mentioned are going to be there in the forties and fifties. That would be good picks for the giants. They all, they all have traits for sure. I love Perry's ball tracking downfield, whether they'll, you know, he'll maybe look it over his inside shoulder. Here's a switch to his outside. He can kind of make those plays, which I think for a tall guy is pretty valuable. And then I think Tillman is somebody that people really like TJ where, you know, he kind of played on that high ankle sprain this year. He had the, he had the surgery so he can come back and play. I think teams like that. And then you go back to his tape from last season, the games he had against Georgia and Alabama, I think, you know, you watch him this year, he looks more like kind of like a big possession guy. But I know some people think he has some more juice based on what he did in 2021. Yeah, you always, you're you a good scout. You've gone back and watched these guys. I, I try. Tell. Yeah, you really do. Yeah, you have to go look at the full body of work because, you know, sometimes these players get dinged for being tough and fighting through injuries. But, the you know, the tape doesn't look as good because they're not running as fast because they're hurt. But really, the, the truth of the matter is they're tough guys. They're fighting through injuries just like we want them to. So you have to look at everything. Go back to when they were juniors and see the real speed that they have. That's a, that's a great point. That's why you have, as a scout, to watch the entire body of work of the player. Otherwise, it's not fair to the player. It's not fair to your club. Yeah, 100%. Are there any interior offensive linemen here? I'm talking center specifically, TJ, that you think are going to be worth the bang for the buck for the Giants at 25? Or do you think at that point you're focusing too much on need and you're doing a little bit of a reach? I think it's a little bit of a reach for the centers at 25. But I will say this, John, the center position has in, has become incredibly more valuable now in the NFL than it used to. And I think in the years to come, you're going to see these centers go higher than they've gone in the past. Uh, like, you know, Joe Tittman. If you take Joe Tittman at, at 25, some people are going to say that's a reach. And it may be a little bit of a reach. But, you know, it, it, Joe Tittman is going to start for eight years at the center position for the team that drafts him. It's not a bad thing. You know, that's a really – important thing to have and like i said the position has changed and become more important so you're going to see these guys starting to go you know john michael schmitz uh scruggs these guys are all going to go higher than they normally would have 
Yeah, I'm going to circle back to the centers in a second because I want to follow up on your answer. But, you know, you, you kind of mentioned that 25 there, you know, just pick the guy that's going to be a good starter for eight years. At what point when you look at this class, TJ, do you start saying in that first round, well, I, I'm into my second round group of players now. So if I can trade back, I'm going to want to trade back because I don't think I'm getting a first round value with with where I'm picking here. So I guess in short, how many first round, true first round grades do you really have in this class? I would. I was looking at that uh, actually last night. I would say you know twenty two to twenty five players. Do you feel really good about taking in the first round? That was for me personally. This you know this is probably the weakest draft in my opinion since two thousand and thirteen. This is there's not a lot of you know pop in this draft, and I think part of that is with the COVID year. You know things the the development kind of was stagnated a bit, but. This is not the strongest draft, but yeah, I would say, you know, in the twenties, the low twenties, I feel good about a first round player. Okay. I think, and then, and that's about where the giants are and, and fans, you can go back and look at that 2013 draft. And, you know, we kind of do you know these analysis on giants.com and that was a rough, rough, rough. Yeah. It was, it was rough for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it wasn't so over the Eagles got Lane Johnson. They were the only yeah, ones that, feeling that, really, that, really good about right. themselves in that first round. But like, literally you look at this more, there's better players in the second and third round that year than you had in the first round. It's crazy. Right. Right. It was, it was a, not a great draft, but the year before it was the Andrew Locke draft. You know, there were some good players. Exactly. And then I think either later you had the, you had the AJ green Julio Jones draft, which was also just a monster. Tyron Smith. That was just one of those monsters. Right top 15s that were just unbelievable. All right, let, let's go back to the centers. You have Tippmann as your one. You have Olu Oluwatimi as your two, which I think is a bit of an outlier. I want to talk to you about that. Then you have John Michael Schmitz as, as your third center on the board. What is it about Tippmann that that has him above the other two guys for you? And why do you have Oluwatimi as, as your second best center? I, I really like Oluwatimi. I love his instincts. I love the way he finishes. He's not a perfect player, but I, I think he's going to be a starter for a long time. Really impressed by him. Great kid. And that, you know, that's a character position as well. You got to be, you got to be smart. You got to be tough. You got to have good character, leadership. I like him a lot. With Titman, John, it's a little different. I mean, he's not your typical six foot three center. This is a tall man. Yeah, this is a tall guy, uh, but he understands leverage. I want to say as a wrestling background, he understands balance. Uh, He stays off the ground. He's a smart kid. You know, the thing with me with Tipman is, you know, I every play I wasn't, wow, this is the greatest guy ever. But when the tape was over and I and I hit stop and I, I was done watching, I'm like, this is a productive player. This is a good player. Every game I watched, he's a productive player. He's going to play a long time, a little bit of a different height than, than you're used to, which I had to get, you know, get over. But I think he's going to be a solid player for a long time. If you lined him up in front of Daniel Jones, I think the Giants fans are feeling pretty good. You know, Oluwatimi, the one thing I'll say, TJ, I'm curious to see how seriously you take this. I thought he had a lot of issues in the one-on-ones at the Senior Bowl, and he almost looked a little overwhelmed by the kind of the, the athleticism of the guys going against him. And that kind of made me a little worried where you get to the NFL level and every day you're playing guys better than the best players you played in college. Did that worry you at all, watching him try to handle some of those, you know, higher level athletes when he got to a level of competition like the senior bowl? It worries me a little bit less at that position because, you know, as you know, the center is usually helping the guard or getting help from yeah, the guard. They're, sure. they're not often in a one-on-one situation. That's why I'll give up a little bit of that to get the other stuff. And that's what Ola Timmy has. So yes, I, I saw what you saw, but I think in a live game, in a real NFL game, things are a little bit different at that position. No, absolutely. I think why I have that on my mind is that I watched Dexter Lawrence basically throw Garrett Bradbury around in that playoff <laughs> game. And, and that's kind of what we had me thinking there. All right, let's go to the corners because I think you guys have these guys ranked pretty interesting too. You have Emmanuel Forbes all the way up at your cornerback number two. Now, I love the tape. TJ, I think it's great. The ball skills, you know, the returns for touchdowns, all that stuff. But again, we go back to the shrinking player, right? He's only, he's sub 170, which is that different for you with corner because they have to tackle unlike wide receivers. So what was your thought process and and, and your group in putting Forbes as your number two wide receiver, uh, number two cornerback, pardon me. Yeah, yeah that it, it's a concern to me, but very similar to the receiver we took. This kid understands how uh, to throw his body around, how to tackle. Not saying that he's a selective tackler, but he understands where to put his head, 
he understands how to do it. So yeah, the size concerns me to a point, but what I love is the strut and the confidence and the ball production. And, you know, as we know, if you're, if your corner is picking off balls and running into the end zone, your team's probably going to win, you know, and that's all this kid, this kid does. So the ball production, the instincts, I just, I couldn't get past it. I loved it. Yeah. And then the other interesting thing I saw in your rank is that you have Keela Ringo, Cam Smith and Garrett Williams all ahead of Deontay Banks out of Maryland, who I love, and I think he'd be a good fit for the Giants based on the way they uh, press and bump and run. He's big. That's what they did in Maryland, right? So what was your thinking and how you kind of rank that next group of cornerbacks down the line? I like Banks, but he left me wanting just a little bit more. I, I saw plays on the field where I was hoping he'd get his hands on the ball, and he didn't do it. Now, they're all kind of there together. Uh they're all kind of clumped together, but I just, he left me wanting just a bit more on the field with the ball in the air. That was my only problem with Banks. What did you guys really like about uh, Ringo, Cam Smith, and Garrett Williams? I like Ringo's straight line speed. Uh, you know, he made the huge play in the first national championship game. I like his size. He's a little tight, uh, but he, I think he's going to be a good player. Uh, Cam Smith. I, he's just such a smooth athlete. I love his feet. I love his uh, uh, ability to move laterally. Not a super physical guy, but it, th there's a lot of corners in this draft. They all kind of do some different things, and there's going to be a lot of good. You're going to be able to get a good corner in the second round, I really think. Uh, there's there's good players. Yeah, and these guys of different sizes. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of these drafts recently, TJ, and obviously you've run them. You know it. So many of these slot corners, right, run around the smaller guys that are quick. This year, there's a lot of size outside, whether you're talking to your later, you know, the 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 Stanford corner, Caillou Blue Kelly, you know, Julius Brents. There's a lot of size outside with the cornerback position in this year's draft that goes pretty deep. And the reason I think, and I, this isn't scientific, John, but I think these players get to college and there's so many wide receivers now. And these right. kids that may – have played receiver before now say, Hey, I might have a better chance of being a higher pick as a corner because there, there aren't as many corners. And I think that's what you're seeing this year. Now you got these six footers with 33 inch arms that would have been receivers. Now they're playing corners because, Hey, I could be a first round pick as a corner. Whereas, you know, receivers, there's a bazillion of them. So I think that could be a reason for that. Hey, it's smart, right? I mean, yeah. you're going to get drafted high. You're eventually going to get paid just as much. I mean, the corner and wide receiver market isn't really that much different when you look at the NFL level. So, yeah, if you have a young kid out there, play corner. Play, play corner. corner. Don't play running back. Yeah, don't. that's correct. Don't, <laughs> don't play running back. Uh, I forgot to follow up on something you said before about center. You said it's becoming one of the more – it's becoming more and more important. Why do you think the center position is becoming more and more important in the modern NFL? My experience with Philadelphia, with, with Kelsey, our offense opened up and we were able to do so many different things on offense because of his ability, especially his athleticism. You know, he could be 25 yard down, yards down the field and he could play on his feet and make blocks. So I think with the spread offenses, with the way the running games are, and the way the passing games are, that guy has to be really smart and if you have a good one, your offensive coordinator is really happy because they can do they can they can just do a lot of different things in regards to the run and the pass game. It opens up so many different things if you have an athletic guy, if you have a good player at that position. And you and I, I'm just becoming more and more of a believer in that for sure. Yeah, and you know you talk about the athletes on defense that the center has to deal with these fast linebackers. They're down to like two thirty. They can run. It's just kind of a different type of game. And, you know, the Eagles last year, you guys took Jordan Davis out of Georgia, the behemoth in the middle. Is it more important, TJ, now to have that big run-stuffing defensive tackle because the guys behind them are a little bit smaller and need to run, and maybe you want to play more coverage back there and you want that guy in the middle of your defense to be able to eat up the blockers and, and frankly, I'm not going to say stop the running game on his own, but at least play a large part in allowing your back seven to do what they need to do in coverage. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. You know, the, these linebackers, some of these guys are under 220 pounds. They look like safeties now. I mean, I, like know, who, we just did Landon Collins, and I forget what year it is. Now I go to the combine, every linebacker looks like Landon Collins. They all look right. like him. 
what I think you're going to start seeing, John, is people zagging when everyone else is zigging. I think you're going to see teams say, okay, uh, if you want to have a 218-pound linebacker, we're going to line up in 13 personnel and pound you. And I think that could very well start happening. The issue is the rules are slanted towards the passing game so much that you have to take advantage of it. And that's what teams do. But, you know, you see the Michigans, you see the Stanfords, you see those teams, they line up with a bunch of tight ends and, 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 and they take advantage of those smaller teams and just kind of pound them. You might see more of that. Yeah. And, and again, I think you have that big guy in the middle and that kind of is your check against that type of strategy, right? And, and and you and if you pick them high, you know you're you're picking an elite athlete who's also a big guy in the middle, and that like you said, that helps out that 220 pounder behind him just to to kind of mitigate that run game. Why do you think it takes TJ sometimes these big defensive tackles a couple years to kind of hit their stride? Because we've seen that in a bunch of different places, right? Quinn Williams took a couple of years, Dexter Lawrence here took a couple of years, uh, Jeffrey Simmons was coming off the ACL, so he took a lot of time. Even Vita Vea's first couple of years wasn't the player he eventually became. Why do you think that defensive tackle spot sometimes takes a couple of years for them to round into form? I asked, I won't mention his name, but I asked a coach that one time because I had the exact same question. And what the answer was, they're asking the defensive front players to do a lot of different things that they weren't asked to do in college. And a lot of these guys are thinking more than playing mm. and year two, they're thinking less because now it's becoming more natural where, you know, in college, it was just kind of go play in the NFL. They're asking to do diff different things. So sometimes it takes a year to get comfortable uh, in that position. Just like if, you know, the first time you drove to work, you needed directions and your map and you didn't know where to go by the 20th time you drove the work you could do it with your eyes closed so that's kind of how it is with those d linemen now it makes perfect sense i'm taking a look at your rankings on the d line and two made me smile because frankly i think i'm on the same page as you guys when it comes to these two you know maybe the number is exact but you know lucas van ness you guys have ranked of your 29th rated prospect a lot of people have him going in the top 10 of the draft this year. I think he's very raw. I don't know if he's a, you know, he's kind of a tweener and then tackle. And then you have Kalijah Kansi at 69, who I know a lot of people have, you know, top 15, top 20 in this draft. And, and I watch him and yeah, his get off's great. He's super quick. I just think once these NFL guards get their hands on him, and I know he's got good hands to, to, to keep their hands off, but he's got such short arms. I just don't know how he plays on early downs early in his career. Kind of give me your thumbnail on, on those two and why maybe you don't see them as highly as some other people might. I agree with you exactly on, on Van Ness, but I'm going to just talk about Cansey. You know, when I watched Cansey, I, 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 before I even knew who he was, I said, Oh man, good. Now we have a good, big, strong linebacker. Finally, we don't have a 220 pound linebacker, <laughs> but he was a defensive lineman. Uh, yeah. I would have very, much concerns with him i think he's a inside sub pass down rusher and uh serious concerns about his his size when they get their hands on him he's done and i didn't see elite athleticism or quickness i mean i thought he was good i didn't see elite so to me i don't quite see what other people are seeing and if someone takes him in the top 15 is top 20. I would have serious concerns about that, John. You know, TJ, you have him right, right next to the other undersized three technique defensive tackle in the chef, right at, at a bar, a out of Northwestern. And honestly, I know maybe the tape's not as good. I like out traits a lot better than Canty. A, I think his body's a lot better ready for the NFL. And I don't mind the player that's short. If he has really long arms, and adabari has got 34-inch arms, and that, to me, the natural leverage, you got the length, that, to me, gives him a really big window combined with his crazy testing and the agility drills and stuff. Uh, I see some uh, almost a bigger upside for that player, to be quite honest with you. And if you ask some of these offensive linemen, the guys that they don't want to block are those short, sawed-off guys with yeah. length who are explosive. They're hard, they're hard block. You know, not saying the other guys aren't, but yeah, he's going to be an interesting guy to track as his career moves on. Because I, I feel like people are all over the lot on him. Some people love him and some people don't. Yeah, and I get it. Look, because he wasn't dominant on tape in Northwestern, right? right? And I, I get it. But then you look at the traits and you're like, oh, but what can he become? And you get all excited. Uh, a right. couple other positions I want to touch with, with you, TJ. 
I guess we'll start here first. What group do you like the best? Top to bottom, depth, that you just kind of look at and you're like, wow, this is, even if it's a weaker draft class, this is an exceptional group where if I'm looking for a good player, this is a position where I'm probably going to have to attack in this draft. I think we talked about corners. I just feel like there's like seven or eight, nine corners that rolled off our mouth as we were talking about them. They're all going to be good players. So I think corner, you're going to be able to get a good player. I think receiver, you're going to be able to get a good player. Um, Those two positions kind of stick out to me the most. I feel like there's a few really good tight ends. There's going to be some tight ends that are going to be good players as well. Yeah, I want to dive into the tight end class a little bit because I'm with you. I think Michael Mayer, to me, just reminds me of Jason Witten, right? You see him. He doesn't look like he's running fast, but he's always open. He always catches the ball. He can block. That is as safe as you want a safe pick in the first round. That is as safe of a pick as you can get. And then I love Dalton Kincaid. I just think he has special receiving skills down the field. Uh, just his, his the smoothness of catching it and transitioning as, as a runner after the catch. And then my my third tight end, I know other people don't like him much. I love the Laporta kid from Iowa. I know he was in a bad offense, but boy, he's smooth. And I think if you get him with the, with a good offense, I think he's going to be a really good player. Yeah, and Iowa's had a history of, of good tight ends. I mean, I think it's a pretty deep class. You mentioned Mayer. I like what he can do. He, he's even going to get better in the run game, too. He's going to get stronger. He's going to become a better blocker. And when these guys are matched up against these smaller linebackers, they're a tough cover. And these now these tight ends have such great ball skills and hands and length and size. You, you know, they box out these linebackers. It's hard to cover those guys. Tough, tough deal. You know, and I don't know if you have any three down running backs in this draft besides, you know, Bijan, maybe, you know, Zach Charbonnet, a couple guys. But I think you get to the mid rounds. You're looking for a guy that can fill a specific role for you whether it's there's a couple really good between the tackle guys, then you have a bunch of, you know, the Eric Grays, the Tajay Spears guys that can kind of be that scat back for you. I feel like you have a really nice combination of backs throughout this draft where if you're looking to fill a specific role, TJ, you can find someone that's pretty darn good for you. You can find someone that's pretty darn good and they can all catch, most of them can catch the ball. But I mean, you mentioned Bijan. To me, what he did in the past game, there was, I've had people that have compared him to McCaffrey in the past game. And this guy has some rare qualities as a receiver in regards to route running and his ball skills and hands. He's tremendous. It's funny. We've done a couple of mock drafts here and I've been assigned the Eagles a couple of times and at pick at pick 30, I've given them Bijan Robinson twice. And as someone that works for the giants, putting him with Jalen hurts in that offensive line is frightening to me. I don't right. know how you stop that running game. Because of his ability as a pass catcher, TJ, could you see Howie Roseman pulling a trigger on a B. John Robinson in the first round? I know he doesn't usually, you know, like to use high picks on running backs. You know, could he even trade down from 10 and pick a mid first? How do you think the Eagles would, would view Robinson as an option for them with them holding two first round picks? Normally, I would say that Howie would never pick a back in the first round. But I think it's a little bit different this year because they are making a run at the Super Bowl again. And he will make an immediate impact on that team and he will open up that offense even more. So I would not rule against them, even with their first first round pick, pick and Bijan. I'm not saying that's out of the, the realm of possibility at all. Yeah, it's funny when I think and about as a this, Giants fan, you probably don't want them to do that. No, absolutely not. It's a nightmare. You know, I, yeah. I, I had to watch Miles Sanders in um, Boston Scott put 250 on the Giants twice last yes. year. If you got Bijan back there, holy you know, Tamale, geez, I don't know how they're going to stop that. I know. It's ridiculous. They got a really good roster there. We The one thing we haven't touched on yet are, are the edge guys, TJ. What do you think of the class in general, and who are some of the guys that you really like, you know, either end first, maybe end the second round, where the Giants could be in the mix maybe for some of these guys that could think fit Wink Martindale's scheme? Well, I mean, Will Anderson to me, I know he's probably not a giant, but Will Anderson, to me, played better last year than he did this year, and I'm not sure why. I saw that Alabama give up a lot of points, Um, so that was concerning to me. Uh, I don't know if there's a guy in the second round that the Giants will pick as as a pass rusher. I, to me, I think if they're going receiver or, uh, you know, inside offensive line, but... To me, if there was a guy in the second round, no one's talking about him. I'm going to say it right here, right now. He's from Tennessee, and his name's Byron Young. And he's an explosive pass rusher that ran 4-4. 
to me, that would be a guy that if I were a Giants fan, I would keep my eyes on. And people aren't really talking about it. How do you guys view age in that respect? Because I agree. I think his athleticism is great. I think he's a little raw, but he has promised. But he's 25, right? So how do front offices look at age when they try to figure out how much more upside a guy might still have? That's certainly a factor. He's going to be a 25-year-old rookie. But the way I would look at it is I'm going to get this kid for four years and I'm going to have him produce for four years and he'll be 29 by then. So it is a concern. It is something we would discuss. But to me, the talent, I, I see the talent. I see the explosiveness. That's definitely a guy I would consider if I were the Giants. As someone who planned against the Giants the last couple of years, how important is it for them to to try to improve that cornerback core where you have a little bit more confidence out there playing that, you know, press man scheme that Wink Martindale wants to play? Because as you know, if you have a corner who can shut people down, it changes everything you can do on defense. You you can send pressure. You can you can get creative. If you know, I mean, look at the cro- the team across from you with Sauce. I mean, that guy can shut people down, and that opened up things they could do on defense. So if you have that guy, it makes a huge difference for your defense. All right, TJ, finally, you have – Former Eagle Brandon Brown here as the Giants assistant general manager, among others in the organization. What does he and, and and kind of the group that came over from Philly bring with them that you think can help the Giants long term? And just your take on how this Giants front office and coaching staff have, have tried to turn this thing around over the last couple of years. I've been really impressed. I can speak on Brandon. I worked with Brandon. Incredibly intelligent, incredible hard worker. He has a deep football knowledge. He's going to be a general manager soon. Uh, he's a good one to have. And then they also brought a, a young man named Mike DeReese over from the Colts. Uh, and Mike is going to be a GM as well. So you have two future GMs sitting in that room uh, helping your decision maker. And the Giants are in great hands, believe me. And then final question, just big picture from a Giant perspective, is I know you tracked the division. What's the next step when the Giants are kind of in this process, right? From a From a team building perspective. They have an unexpected successful first year. You pay your quarterback, who I think had the best year of his career, and now you're trying to build. How do they go about this, TJ? What's kind of the next step to make sure you keep going uphill here? I think that you have to support the quarterback, and what what you want to see is next year the quarterback take even another step, and that means maybe you know a little deeper into the playoffs, where you can put your fist down and say, this quarterback can take us to the promised land. So by saying that, you need to get him weapons and you and you need to protect him. It's all about the quarterback. It's a quarterback league. We think we have one in New York, and we just have to continue and see pro- progression. Now, we are on the same page there. TJ, this was so much fun. I hope to do it again with you. Thank you very much. And just tell the folks anything they need to know about what you guys are doing at the, th- at the 33rd team. Well, I, all I'll say is we have uh, four scouts total that, that really delved into the draft. All four scouts have NFL experience, been in draft rooms, watched film, made decisions. So I think our website gives a little different spin because of that. And they can go to the 33rd team, read about all the players, read a lot of great content, a lot of great coverage, and it's it's a it's a fun site. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm on it almost daily. T.J. McRae. 3013, longtime NFL executive of the personnel department. We thank you for joining us on the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by PSENG. Stay tuned, everybody. You're about a week out of the draft. We'll keep covering it right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app and on your favorite podcast platforms.